my job to welcome everybody to this webinar. Um, my name is Alison McFarlane and I'm chair of the um, Royal Statistical Society's official statistics section, uh, one of the joint organisers of this series of webinars. And up to now, um, we've been focusing on analyses that have come online um, fairly recently where people, particularly within the government statistical service, have been explaining the analyses they've done. Um, today's um, series of presentations is part of a new phase. We've not, no one is, of course, in, under any illusions the pandemic's finished, but we are at the phase where it's time to look back and reflect on what's being done and what's being learnt. And I'd like to uh, welcome you to this webinar, which is designed to do just that. Um, and we've got a wide range of speakers. And um, it's my pleasure to um, hand over to Dina Ledbeter, who is uh, chair of the Health Statistics User Group, the other co-organiser, um, uh, and who is going to actually chair the webinar. Uh, thanks, Alison. Uh, so welcome to everybody to uh, this, which is the um, the ninth in this series of webinars that we've been holding, Health Stats User Group have been holding um, in collaboration with the RSS official stats section. And we're very grateful to the RSS for enable to hosting these and so we can run this series. It's interesting that looking back that the first one in the series was actually on mortality. Obviously, it seems like a very long time ago in May 20, uh, 2020, and I think Vahi spoke at that. So much has happened since then. As Alison says, we are sort of now in, a, in the process of looking back, even though the pandemic is um, very far from over. Um, all the uh, the webinars in the series and also this one are posted on the website and we now have a new um, uh, webinar material section. Um, this is within Stats Usernet in their health and care section. There's a new uh, section for webinar materials where you can actually you will see materials from this webinar and also from all the other ones if you want to look back at what we've done um, over the series. Um, now, I'm, I'm afraid, just apologies, we're, uh, I'm flying a bit blind today because although I've, I've got the presentations, I've seen the presentations, for some reason, my screen is not showing them as they're going through. So I'm gonna have to ask um, people to um, uh, tell me when they're at the beginning and the end of their presentations. So um, if we could just, I could start doing a few introductions um, and First of all, the housekeeping. So could we have the, the housekeeping side, please? Um, where just to remind people that um, questions are submitted via the chat. Um, I put some questions that we had in advance up on the chat beforehand, which I hope you can see, but I will repeat those at the beginning of the Q&A section. Um, as I said, everything, all the presentations will be available afterwards. There's an awful lot to see, an awful lot of material to cover. So um, you may want to be going back and having a look at those on the website um, to look at them in more detail. Um, and there will be a recording that we posted in a few days time. Um, and then in terms of the introduction, the next slide um, where we're looking at the values for the webinar, um, we always say at the beginning, to reinforce the fact that what we're doing with this series of webinars is sharing, sharing uh, across the four nations, sharing between people working at national level and, and regional and local level. And it's through that sharing exchange of ideas, we think we can sort of improve um, what's going on. So feel free to offer comments and suggestions as well as questions in the chat because we know that there's a range of expertise amongst the participants and not just among the speakers. Um, all the Q&A will be captured and will be included in the report at the end. Um, so um, I'd now like to introduce the speakers. What we will be doing, we'll be running through all the speakers and then we'll have a, Q, a shared Q&A at the end. Um, uh, very pleased, as I said, to welcome back um, Bahi Nafilan from, from ONS. Um, who is, is talking, I think, about some, some recent work as well as um, a sort of overview. And then Ronan Lyons um, from um, Swansea University, um, Professor of Public Health there, but talking about um, collaboration work and work that's been done in Wales. And Tom, Tom Hennell is going to be looking at more the regional perspective, because as Alison said, it's very important to look at not just what's happening at national level, but how this impacts um, at a more regional and local level. And then 
last but definitely not least, we have Jos from Northern Ireland, uh, which we're very pleased to welcome because this is the first time we've managed to have a speaker from Northern Ireland um, looking at the work done in Northern Ireland on mortality. So that's our series of very interesting uh, speakers. Um, and um, I look forward to hearing the presentations and, as I say, um, viewing the, the slides offline because I'm not actually seeing them. So I will hand over to Vahe to introduce his slides. Thank you very much, Dina. So I'm going to talk not about a retrospective look over the pandemic yet, uh, but I wanted to present instead some very recent results that we've uh, produced. It was published on the ONS website yesterday, and this is an analysis of uh, the risk of death following COVID-19 vaccination, focusing on young people, so people aged below 30 in England. Next slide. Can I just do the slide now? Okay. So as you all know, I hope um, COVID, you all know that COVID-19 vaccines are highly effective against uh, serious illness, uh, including death and hospitalization. But for young people, there's been some reports of uh, cases of myocarditis and myopericarditis following COVID-19 vaccination. And this has led to concerns about the safety of the vaccination and and question and some questions about the cost as uh, risk benefit assessment for for the vaccines for instance the heart group sent a letter to the uh, mhra about the potential excess deaths that were seen uh, looking at death registration and they highlighted the fact that this could be linked to the covid 19 vaccination so therefore we undertook a study investig investigating this this matter it's to know that the balance of risk and benefit is particularly important for young people because they've got a lower background risk of, of COVID-19 hospitalization, hospitalization and deaths. So you, you know, just a few deaths due to the vaccine could seriously affect this assessment. So what we've been looking at is whether there is a change in the incidence of cardiac and all-cause deaths in young people following uh, a COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide, please. So the data was what we used. We use a death registration data linked to the vaccination, the COVID-19 vaccination records, uh, provide com coming from the NIMS. And we also added a special extract uh, of vaccination records that are not in uh, NIMS. So basically, for people who've died very shortly after a vaccination, there is a chance uh, that the vaccination record has not been sent to NIMS. And therefore, for a vaccine safety study, that would be a big issue. And here we we were we managed to get an extract of these vaccination uh, records for people who died very shortly after COVID-19, directly from the point of care system. The statistical method we use is a self-control case series studies. It's very difficult to look at the mortality, uh, comparing the mortality of of people who've been vaccinated and people who have not vac been vaccinated in young people because the people who've been vaccinated earlier, who've been prioritized, are the people with comorbidities. So if you just compare vaccinated and unvaccinated, you're unlikely to be able to isolate the effect of the COVID-19 vaccine on mortality. So instead, we use this self-controlled case series, which is a method that was developed to study the adverse uh, reactions to vaccines. And the idea is to compare the incidence of the outcome, so here it's death, in a risk period, so here the risk period we use is the first six weeks after vaccination. So whilst myocarditis tend to occur very soon after vaccination, the median time is two days. We wanted to we use a larger risk period to uh, to be able to capture all the deaths that could occur due to the vaccine. And then we've got a baseline period. Uh, so here we use week seven to twelve, and then we assess whether basically we compare the number of deaths in in one period and the other. So why do we use only 7 to 12? So, oh yeah, so here, sorry, I apologize, because when I put the formatting of the RSS, I, I think I lost all my uh, links I had in my slide. So could you go back, can you go to the end of my presentation, please? I'm really sorry about that. Yes, it, uh, no, sorry, two slides back, next. There we are, sorry about that. So this is to show you the, the problem because obviously it takes time for deaths to be registered after they've occurred, especially for younger people because a lot of deaths are from external causes and therefore take a long time to be registered. 
So here what it shows is a number of tests um, uh, by the time since vaccination. So you can see that it is declining quite quite rapidly after 12 weeks. And this is an, eff this is a, a, an effect, an artifact of the registration delays because people who've, who've died to have died 40 weeks after vaccination, it means the death has occurred. Uh, if if people have been vaccinated late in the calendar year, they are unlikely to have died. They, they can't. They haven't been observed for 40 weeks, and the deaths cannot have been yet registered. So that's why we used a relatively short time windows of 12 weeks uh, to conduct this study. So we could, could we go back to where we were before, please? Thank you. So that's that's why we we only look at 12 weeks. So here are those results. So they were in, in within the 12 weeks after vaccination, there were 585 deaths uh, of, of young people, so young people aged 12 to 29, and 105 were cardiac related deaths, or cardiac deaths, I should say. And, um, and here what you see on the graph is a relative incidence of deaths um, compared to the week seven to 12 being the baseline. So you, on top, you've got week one to six. So what you'd show that basically there is no difference in the incidence of deaths, either for cardiac deaths or all-cause deaths uh, in the whole baseline period. And when you look at cardiac deaths, there is no evidence of any uh, change in the risk in the number of deaths uh, in the week following the vaccination. What is quite interesting is if you look at, at the right on the all-cause deaths, in week one, there is a lower risk of uh, deaths. And, and that's uh, the well-known healthy vaccine effect. So it's the people who get, when people get vaccinated, they tend to be in good health um, and better health. And later on, it just reflects the fact that you need to be fit, fit enough to be vaccinated. So we, we see this evidence of this in our study. Next slide, please. So then what we've done is uh, looking at different subgroups to see if uh, you know, maybe there are some some effects, but they are hidden because they are in some subgroups. So we've we've looked at different uh, age groups, so 12 different three, three age groups, uh, by sex, by the dose, and by the type of vaccination. So looking at um, messenger RNA and other adenovirus uh, vaccines. And here again, we find no evidence whatsoever of any difference uh, between in terms of mortality between the week one to six and seven to 12. Next slide. So what we did as well was to look at what is the difference. Uh, if, so here we've looked at time since vaccination, but what we want to say, what, what about if we look at time since COVID-19 infection in unvaccinated individuals? So this is to bring, a, in a, to, if you want to assess the benefit risk of the vaccine, you need to see what well, if you're not vaccinated and you get COVID, then what, what what will happen? And what we can see is that we find a raised risk of cardiac and all cause related deaths in the weeks immediately after vaccine uh, after infection. So that's not not surprising, but we can see relatively large in, uh, relative incidence. And this is you, know, you can use this to contrast and and uh, compare with the vaccine uh, with the deaths following vaccination. So here you find much higher quite a raised risk of uh, of mortality after um, infection. So here we looked at all the infection that occurs since the start of mass testing in people who were unvaccinated, age 12 to 29. Next slide, please. So what is the take home message of our study is that COVID-19 vaccination did not increase the risk of death in young people. So there is, there's been some cases of myocarditis and myopericarditis, but they didn't lead to, to deaths which is reassuring. So obviously it's not the whole picture because mortality is just one aspect. Uh, obviously myocarditis can be very severe and have some long-term effects. Uh, so this needs to be taken into account and more research needed for here. So the limitation is that the analysis is based on incomplete deaths in a way because we have only got deaths registered by the 16th of February. So, and registration delays can be substantial, but what we've seen in, in that graph is that actually the registration delays are worse for uh, the further away people have died from vaccination because the further away people have died from vaccination, the later in the calendar year they would have died and the less likely the death is to have been registered. But this nonetheless uh, highlights the importance to okay, yes. not necessarily do this analysis as a one-off, but of keeping to keep monitoring the deaths of, and the side effects of vaccinations. 
Thank you very much. That's, oh, there's a slide with backgrounds. So apologies for messing up the, the links. So you're, the other slides are going to be um, available, but you're not going to talk to them. They're just the background. I'm just, just checking with you now. Yes, um, exactly. They are just uh, further information. Oh, yeah, that's great. Right, we did. We've done that in other webinars because there's not, not enough time to go through everything. So they will be posted if people want to, to have a look at those. Um, so we will now move on to the next presentation from Ronan, Ronan Lyons from, from Wales. So um, uh, I'll hand over to you, Ronan. That's fine. Um, and can, can you hear me fine? Yes, we can hear you fine. Yeah. Yes. OK, so, so, so this is work which I've, um, Rhiannon Owen has largely been doing the analysis on, um, on behalf of this team that we have, the One Wales team, working currently for Welsh Government as part of the pandemic. Um, so if we just move on one, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge the large numbers of people who've been involved in it with different organisations, several of which I've, I've, I've mentioned here, particularly from ADR UK and Health Data Research UK, and, and the grant we also had from the MRC, which enabled us to do this work. And again, um, to do this in, in Wales, we use a, a thing called the SAIL Data Bank. Uh, many of you may have heard about it. It's essentially a privacy protecting system which has been in operation since 2008 and is actually funded by, by Welsh Government. Um, all the data are de, de identified. Um, it's a privacy protecting system, as I said. It works very well and it's available then to the research community and public sector analytical teams. So next. Um, so it, when this um, pandemic started, uh, we basically decided to link all the data on the entire population of Wales that we could put together to actually help understand the evolution of the pandemic and the effectiveness of countermeasures. So we were fortunate to be able to link data on virtually the entire population. As part of that, one of the things which helped enormously was permission to, um, from ONS to link in the 2011 census, and, and that particularly helped with ethnicity. We're also bringing in data on um, health, social care and education workforce, and very many data sets, as you can see um, down um, along on the left hand side. Um, the protocol paper for this has been published a while ago, um, you can see it there on, on the right hand side. And again, if we move on one. So basically the, the rationale behind this was for us to support the Welsh Government COVID-19 Technically Advisory Group. Um, and there were three particular areas of work that we, we spend quite a lot of time on, trying to understand patterns of transmission, um, and particularly then about how they happen in different settings. And so to do that, we had created de-identified linkages at, at multiple levels. So we follow up all the individuals, they're linked to households, care homes, hospitals and GPs and, and schools. Um, more recently, as, as you can see from work that Vahe and others are doing, we've also been spending quite a lot of time in the analysis of data about vaccination, particularly about uptake and indications, the effectiveness and safety. And then the third area really is about monitoring the indirect effects and countermeasures, um, how that's been happening. And an aspect of which, we're, which we're picking up is the evaluation of new models of care, which has uh, arised as part of the uh, necessity of dealing with the pandemic. So if I move on to the next one, um, just to say, there are lots of different analyses which have been conducted. Uh, we were part of the work on the QCOVID uh, risk prediction algorithm that was developed by Julie Hipsy Cox and colleagues. And there's been separate validations of that in, in England, one led by Vahe and ourselves in Wales, on, which is the publication on the left hand side. Basically, the models fit just as well in Wales as they do elsewhere. We've been also looking at many different conditions. I'll just point to this one on the right hand side because it's, it's, it's quite important. 
Um, the lockdown uh, had a huge impact on patients with COPD. And we've had a, you know, compared to anything else, massive reductions in both hospitalizations and mortality in that group. So just bear that one in mind to like, when I come to the main analysis then. Next, yeah. So, so this is essentially um, what we've been doing for this analysis. So we've been it's effectively graphically comparing observed and expected um, deaths by fitting a negative binomial model to the January 2016 to December 29 data, and then predicting what we would be expected to see between January 2020 and January 2022. So the gray areas, the shading illustrates the 95% prediction interval, and the red dots are like frequencies higher than that. And there's also some sensitivity analysis being done um, looking at uh, dying with due to COVID or with COVID, which didn't really change anything. So you can see here from the all cause mortality um, and uh, on the left hand side, substantial increases um, which align with the peaks of the cause of death from the COVID, which are shown on, on, on the right hand side. So the top graph on the right side is all cause mortality, and then the dotted lines on the bottom are essentially deaths due to COVID. And you can see how they parallel each other, and also therefore, and also how they fit against what were the dominant variants which are, are present there. Um, on the left hand side too, you can see in 2018, sort of the red dots that we had with the excess mortality as part of the last flu, flu um, epidemic. Next. Um, one of the things that we've been also looking at is place of debt. Um, and again, you can see from the time trends, there's been a, a substantial change here, um, particularly with, with the blue line, which would sort of a, a doubling in the first wave and a near doubling in, in the second wave of the numbers of people dying at, dying at home. Um, and that's quite a, 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 a change from what we've seen. Next. Uh, one of the things that we, we spent some time looking at earlier were what was happening in care homes. We'd previously been involved in work looking at mortality in care homes, so we were quite easily able to adjust that. So the first four lines on this really are the survival curves for care home residents in Wales uh, from 2016 up until 2019. And then in, in the green one, you can see what happened in 2020, a very substantial increase. Effectively, when you adjusted for everything, it was a 70% excess mortality during that period. And next. Um, deprivation is an area that we've looked at. Um, one of the things we've been sort of decomposing um, the plots here, um, and looking at the trends, seasonal effects and random components. So if we looked at the most deprived group on the left and the least deprived group, the one below that, the patterns for all of this are very, very similar. And on the right hand side, so what we, we have is not really a change in the impact of deprivation. We have very marked um, mortality ratios by deprivation, but they did not change during, during the pandemic. Next. Uh, so one and another area is to look at ethnicity. Um, Wales has a relatively small ethnic population and due to some of the small sample sizes for the black population, we're, we're not showing data on that here. Um, what we are looking at is the sort of trends in the sort of mortality amongst the white population and the Asian population across the different in wavelengths with the white population on, on the left hand side and the Asian population on the right hand side. And I think what one of the things which is slightly surprising in this is that, you know, the subsequent waves of infections seem to have had a larger impact on the Asian population than we saw in, in, in the original wave, as you, as you can see on the graphs. And then next, So 
we won't focus on this graph <laughs> for very long. As you say, it's really busy. Um, it's just an introduction into the next one in which we've been looking at what the, have the trends been in by the different ICD ch chapters. So I'll move on to the next ones which show the more interesting chapters. So again, you can see the, 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 what we've been looking at is essentially the observed patterns, fitting the predicted patterns, and then comparing the observed against those. So you can see here um, very considerable excesses of respiratory deaths on, on the left hand side and also some cardiovascular deaths on the right hand side. And just bear in mind what I said to you about the reduction in deaths in patients with COPD for respiratory ones. These are all deaths essentially effectively from, from um, pneumonia. And again, the next one. Um, again, cancer. Um, there's a general upward trends over time, but again, you can see where we're where we're quite out of kilter there with considerable excesses of cancer deaths since the pandemic has has continued. And then next, two other chapters here from um, mental health. Um, again, you can see in the first wave we did have a spike, and then also um, another one a bit further on on the left hand side and the right hand side, the trauma ones are, are interesting in that we've had a very considerable increase in, in trauma deaths on the right side, largely as a result of excess falls and, and fractures. The thing about trauma deaths, they get registered late, so don't worry about that sort of massive tail off at the end. That's fairly common due to delays in registration. And then I think the next one is just the sort of quick summary and conclusion. So we, we've had quite a bit of excess old cause mortality um, in each wave, obviously lower in the Omicron dominant period. Most deprived groups stayed as they were. Uh, our higher mortality is, is, is built in, sadly, to the system. We've had this higher mortality in the Delta wave in, in Wales in the Asian group, and then these interesting findings by pattern by ICT-10. So I will stop there. I'm sure my time must be up. Uh, thank you very much, Ronan. I mean, so much in there and really, really fascinating. I think we may want to come back to uh, some more discussion in the Q&A. Um, but for the moment, thank you. Um, and uh, we'll now hand over to the next speaker, Tom Hennell, who, as we said, is going to be looking at it more from the, the regional perspective on, on the relevance of the mortality data. So over to you, Tom. Well, thank you very much. Um, I should say I'm Tom Hennell. I'm the Principal Public Health Intelligence Analyst for Local Knowledge and Intelligence Northwest, which is now a part of OHID, has had previously been a part of National Health, Public Health England. This is a tool that we've developed within the regional offices for local knowledge and intelligence within OHID. I've done the sums the graphical presentation is due to my colleague Simon Orange and his team in Local Knowledge and Intelligence, Northeast and Yorkshire. So thanks to Simon for that. Next slide, please. This is the, these um, pick out the characteristics. I'm afraid it's a fairly detailed list. I'll pick out the highlights. We have been provided by ONS since the start of the pandemic with individual provisional re records of death registration. So these are all provisional, um, though from January 2021 onwards up to, up to the end of 2020, we are using the definitive death registration records. Um, but these are, our objective is to try to make this data um, more recent data available to within the populations for the new integrated care service areas. Integrated care services are a sub-regional geography which is intended to unite NHS geographies and local government geographies to look at integrated patterns of care. So as we will demonstrate, we, there are within the Northwest three such sub-regions. So these are fairly large populations, uh, though their size varies substantially across the country. And we're looking to plot excess standardized years of life lost against 
the modelled expected years of life lost had the pandemic not occurred using the years 2015 to 19. And we're using for this purpose the, the not the ICD chapters, which Ronan used, but the WHO definition of leading causes of death, which among other things allows us to pick out individual leading cancers. What's also notable in this analysis is that we're working by month of occurrence rather than by month of registration. So this is occurrence data, which does mean that it is in the um, provisional data set is not complete, but is fairly complete. And it does then allow us to adjust for the numbers of days in the month and so on in order to generate an equivalent um, standardized potential years of life lost. Um, we've also generated within the tool standardized rates both for all ages and for deaths under 75 um, because we reckon that displaced mortality affects um, lower deaths now because in populations that otherwise died earlier in the pandemic months but we reckon that that will affect the under 75 deaths to a lesser degree and for this analysis we're looking at excesses for the period january to october 2021 next slide please this demonstrates the general format that simon and his team developed at the bottom we are looking we're plotting the excess um above the line is extra deaths below the line is less deaths than expected and then above there the we have the bar charts the diamonds represent the average from 2015 rate from 2015 to 19 with the range 2015 to 19 highest and lowest as the bars we've also imposed on there the national equivalents the national average is the red circles the observed england average for this month of the year is the red crosses and as we can say we can see for ischemic heart disease it varies above and below the line but in 2021 there were fewer deaths lower potential years of life lost in general but next slide when we look just at ischemic heart disease under 75, the opposite is the case. Under 75, there were three months, May, June, July of 2021, when there was high excess mortality, indeed well outside the range of uh, uh, potential years of life lost that had been observed in the 2015 to 29 period. Next slide, please. This shows a more particular example. As we said, we can pick out leading cause cancers. This is colorectal cancer. As we can see, overall in 2021, that tends to be in excess. Next slide, please. And that excess is even more apparent when we're looking at deaths under 75. This is not the case across the country, but it is certainly the case in the Northeast and the Northwest. Next slide, please. We're now moving down to an individual integrated ser care service area. This is Greater Manchester. And we can see that um, we're here looking at cirrhosis and we can see that that has an excess in the period 2021. Next slide, please. We can also see dementia. Dementia doesn't have an overall excess in 2021, but we have observed that from July onwards, it was consistent, dementia deaths at, were consistently in excess, and a series of other degenerative conditions were there as well. So, um, Parkinson's disease um, and various other forms of degenerative conditions also appeared to have had excesses from July 2021 onwards. Next slide, please. And this simply summarizes the position all across the three um, integrated care service areas. So in all three, cirrhosis was positive in 2021. In all three, colorectal cancer 
had an excess. Dementia had an excess in Greater Manchester and Lancashire, South Cumbria. Ischemic heart disease, all causes had an excess in Cheshire, Merseyside, Lancashire and South Cumbria. And stroke had an excess in Lancashire and South Cumbria. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tom. This was, I mean, it's fascinating you know, the different approaches taken and also um, the issue when you start to look at it in more detail at the, the regional and, and, and the lower areas. It's absolutely fascinating. There's, there's so much in there that hopefully we can pick up um, in some in the Q&A or maybe in some further discussions. So thank you very much. And now to our, our final speaker and uh, looking at um, situation in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, that is uh, Jos. Um, so hand over to you. Is that a lovely background there you've got? Is that? Yes. <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much. Um, hello, my name is Jos Eipler. I work for NISWA and I'm a statistician. And I'm just going to give you a quick overview of, uh, and I know I have only 10 minutes to talk about the different publications uh, published routinely on COVID mortality. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the, the, the key ones, and I'm going to do a very quick overview of them. So the first one is the weekly deaths, um, which is the COVID-19 related deaths in Northern Ireland, uh, published every week, uh, a week in arrears. And COVID related deaths means it's any death where COVID-19 was mentioned on the death certificate. Um, the, the other, the next three, are. Uh, publications are done have been done about four times since the pandemic started so the first one is the COVID-19 related deaths uh, particularly looking at eight standardized mortality uh, the next one is excess mortality and COVID-19 related deaths that we look at the pre-existing conditions so that's any condition that is uh, mentioned on the death certificate as well alongside the COVID-19 deaths and finally, we have a data linkage project uh, where it's linked to the 2011 census and the COVID, COVID deaths. Next slide, please. So just to give you a quick overview of Northern Ireland, which of course is the, the smallest country in, in the UK. So we had the first case in February, the first death in March, and the first lockdown started that month as well. And what you can see from the graph is three distinct waves of deaths. So these are the cumulative COVID-19 related deaths from March till February this year. So we'll see a, an early period from April to say May, June in 2020. Uh, then uh, a long period of low number of deaths, but then an increase again from, say, from October 2020 up until March 2021. Then a period of calm during the summer and then starting again, say, in August. And that's been slowly, you know, more slowly than before, but still a uh, number of deaths uh, been quite steady stream in these, these months. Uh, this comes from the the weekly uh, the weekly COVID nineteen uh, deaths report. Next slide, please. Uh, this one uh, is just an extract from the uh, COVID nineteen related deaths report, looking at the A standardized mortality rates. So there's a variety of analysis in that report. I just want to, to highlight. Uh, just to give you a bit of a picture, I don't know who's all familiar with the geography of Northern Ireland. Um, if you look at the, the top left uh, map, we'll see the dark coloured area is Belfast, which is on the on the east coast. So that had the highest rate in the first wave of the of the pandemic, with surrounding areas you know, lower but still high rates and lower rates in the in the rest of the country. Whereas looking at the second wave and the third wave, the third wave being at the bottom, you see how it had spread over the country yeah, in this period. Um, also in this report uh, shows that there was higher rates in the private areas and in urban areas. And I think the, uh, the earlier speakers already mentioned these kind of developments happening as well. Next slide, please. The excess deaths mortality um, in short, the definition of is we have to take the observed number of deaths and take away the expected number of deaths. Uh, in this case, it was using the number of deaths in the previous five years. Um, so it's a very simplified model. You don't depend on the quality of cause of death information or the availability of population estimates. Um, so it's a quick and 
Rothman radio. So what we see from the first graph is that the, the blue line, the, the access depths, the cumulative, cumulative access depths, follow quite closely the COVID-19 related deaths, uh, definitely in the first year, where they open up a bit of a gap in 2021 of the pandemic. Um, but it's still more or less following the same uh, the same pattern of deaths. Uh, one thing you can do with it, for example, is to look at different dimensions, whether you're looking at area or deprivation. Uh, I just highlighted here one, where is the place of death? So we can see that the majority, uh, the vast majority of COVID-19 related deaths occurred in hospital. That's about 70% of the deaths in this period. Um, so that is going up till I think it was October 2021. Um, whereas when the, looking at the excess deaths, we see the vast majority, that's 80% of the excess deaths occurred at home addresses. So that's residential, the, the residential addresses. So there's, there seems to be quite a move from, uh, from non-COVID related deaths that happened more and more uh, at home. And this seems to be a consistent uh, picture that happened you know, for every month uh, throughout the, the pandemic. Next slide, please. Another thing you can do with the excess mortality is to look at the cause of death. So from the previous five years, you can have expected number of deaths for particular causes and looking at those observed in this period. And now we're talking about March 2020 till June 2021. Uh, this is due to the delay in establishing the underlying cause of death and the delay in registrations as well. So we're looking at this, you know, a bit, a bit of an older picture, but we still see uh, the number of COVID-19 deaths. So in this case, it's no longer the uh, COVID-related. This is where COVID was found to be the underlying cause of death. So we'll see that that number is bigger than the excess mortality of uh, just over 2,000 2, people. So we'll see a few increases in excess deaths in the malignant neoplasms or the, or the cancers. Um, but also uh, in the digestive system, there's an increase of you know ten percent in that period. And on contrary, there's a bit of a decline, particularly in the respiratory system. So this is uh, the grouping of the ICD-10 codes, and and also uh, a small decrease in dementia and Alzheimer disease. Next slide, please. So this is going into the fourth report. This is about the pre-existing condition. So we're talking about any mention on the death certificate that predates or was independent of COVID-19. So whereas the previous uh, reports were looking at deaths on an uh, occurrence basis, this is done on a registration basis uh, going up till September 2021. So uh, what we can see is from that that COVID-19 was the underlying cause of 87% say of COVID-19 related deaths. And when we're looking in detail into those deaths, we see the number of, there's about 10% of the COVID-19 deaths where COVID was the underlying, uh, underlying cause, that there was no pre-existing conditions, there's no other mentions on the death certificate. Um, and on average, there was about two and a half conditions uh, per COVID deaths in Northern Ireland. Uh, the next slide will give you the uh, most common pre-existing conditions. And here at the top, we'll have to mention Alzheimer's disease. So we had 767 mentions of it or a quarter of the COVID-19 deaths. And if you compare that to the, all the deaths in you know, the previous three years, uh, 27 to 2019, there's only 21% of uh, mentions of dementia and Alzheimer's disease on death certificates. So that shows you that there the might be uh, what we've seen from the earlier analysis as well, with a decrease in the number of where uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease was an underlying cause of death, that some of that will be, will have become then the uh, COVID-19 deaths. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, I'm just going to talk about the, the linkage study. So this is where the number, the deaths in March to September 2020 were linked to the 2011 census uh, to look at equality factors. So some of the variables 
uh, we're interested in are not part of the death registration system, but by linking it to the 2011 census, we can say a bit more about these other ones. Um, for example, uh, the first one is, uh, which is always of interest in Northern Ireland, differences between uh, Catholics, uh, Protestant and other Christian groups, uh, where at first it looks like there's a there's a big difference between Protestants and Catholic, with Protestants having a higher age-specific mortality rate. After we're adjusting for sex and for area, uh, that difference disappeared. If you may recall the map I showed earlier, the Protestants most live in the east of the country with Catholics in the west. So because of the geographical pattern of COVID in that early period, uh, that explained for, for quite a bit of uh, any difference that there was before. Uh, we'll also look at the other um, characteristics. So this time in looking at disability, where we're doing some corrections for age, sex, area, demographics and health, etc. And we still find that there is a, 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 an increase in uh, mortality rate of 48 percent higher for those with having a disability in the 2011 census of COVID and a slightly smaller increased risk of 40 percent for non-COVID-19 mortality. Next slide. The next steps is uh, will be a continued release of weekly deaths reports with uh, special specific attention to uh, COVID-19 related deaths. Uh, the, the linkage study I mentioned lastly there will be looking at adding some more deaths to that to look uh, not just at the first wave but also the second and eventually maybe the third wave. And finally there will be uh, some future updates of the other reports although at the time uh, we don't have any times or dates for that uh, but as the COVID pandemic still continues on uh, I'm sure there will be continued interest in that. And just to finally to, to acknowledge the research support units and the, the funders of uh, different parts of this research. And uh, in the last slide, we'll have some contact details and a link, which I also put in the chat there for anyone who wants to find out some more details. Uh, again, I think there's an extended presentation will be circulated to attendees and uh, that will give you a bit more of a flavor. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Just some very sort of striking figures there. But as always, it's kind of like more questions than answers, and it prompts further investigation. Um, and as you said, more detailed information will be posted than you could actually run through um, here on this the short time allowed for the presentations. Um, now, just before we move to the Q and A, which is coming very soon, I would just like to um, ask uh, Emma Sharlan to to say a few words to introduce um, the mortality statistics theme group. For those people who are not familiar with that, this is one way of of taking forward the discussions on, on the very important issues in relation to mortality. So, um, Emma, if you could uh, come online and uh, introduce and explain what the mortality statistics theme group does. Yeah, sure. So um, just to give a bit of a background, um, we have the English Health Statistics Steering Group, which was formed in 2016 um, with the objectives to remove the duplication of statistical releases, harmonise methods and definitions, um, in increase user engagement, align publication dates and improve accessibility of statistics. And this is across the um, breadth of health and care statistics. Um, as part of that, we have 15 theme groups um, which cover a variety of topics for um, health and care statistics and um, will allow us to achieve these aims at a more topic level. Um, so mortality is one of our theme groups that we have um, and that this theme group has been running for a number of years um, by Sarah Cole in ONS. Um, during the pandemic, as you can imagine, this theme group um, proved more useful than ever. And despite everyone being very busy, um, the group itself started to meet fortnightly um, to make sure any of the analysis that they released was consistent across the different organisations. And where it was possible, they were also able to use the group to discuss um, cross UK releases. Um, the group now meet monthly um, and their remit currently is to discuss 
any updates to publications and discover any areas of interest or where they can work together to improve um, the statistics on mortality. Um, and they are made up of uh, both producers and users of the statistics. And unlike some of the other theme groups who are just uh, England focus, they are a cross UK um, theme group as most of the work that they do does impact Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. Um, if you'd like to know any more about the English Health Statistics Steering Group or Mortality Theme Group specifically, um, then please feel free to contact me on uh, gss.health at ons.gov.uk. But happy to take any questions as well. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, that's obviously a very important way to take forward any of the issues that we can't cover now. And hopefully um, the, the report from this webinar will be um, will be looked at by the Mortality Stats theme group. So we now move on to the Q&A section. So I will stop um, sharing the slides if we haven't already done that. And um, if I could ask the speakers to um, sort of come online, that's it, that's great. So we can see um, see everybody. Um, uh, so thank you to the speakers once again, a fascinating set of presentations and it really interesting, slightly different approaches and, um, and also, with particularly, I was, shouldn't have said to Sovahe to kind of hot off the presses um, analysis was really quite interesting to see that in addition to the the overviews from some of the other speakers. So that was really great. Um, I did. Um, we did have some questions coming in in advance. Uh, we do ask for that in our webinars, and usually they don't uh, they don't come. But in this case, mortality being such an, uh, a hot topic, uh, we did have questions in advance, which I have actually we did share with the speakers and. Um, I did post on the chat. So uh, I'll start off by running through those questions. And then um, Rosa Alonso has been looking at the questions coming in on the chat. And we'll then pick up some of the ones that have come through from the participants today. So if I can just start with um, running through the ones we got beforehand. Um, the first one was related to uh, analysis by ethnic group. Um, and um, the comment really was that the production of data on deaths by ethnic group has raised expectations regarding the availability of, of this sort of analysis on a longer term basis. Um, and so the question really is, is that going to be able to be continued? And um, and if so, um, what are the issues regarding collecting that data? Does that require ethnic data be, to be collected at time of death? And is that feasible on an ongoing basis? I mean, I think there's a general issue there about how some of the things we've done during the pandemic, whether that's feasible to continue as we move into a more normal way working afterwards. So uh, in terms of whether this is going to be feasible to take forward, maybe I could hand that to Ronan first, because I know you did mention particularly analyses by ethnicity. Any thoughts on is that is that something that's going to continue um, on an ongoing basis? Well, it's completely feasible. The, the question only is whether we're allowed to do it. Um, and I think it would be a tremendous shame if we if it wasn't to continue. Um, the as I said, we we actually used in, in our analysis 17 different NHS sources for ethnicity and the census. And effectively the census beat them all hands down. Um, due to poor recording of ethnicity in many NHS databases. Um, so I think the, you know, ongoing linkage of census data to the NHS data is, is, is absolutely crucial in, in, in doing this. Um, obviously, we'd like to see that supplemented by um, more up-to-date um, metrics. Uh, there is an issue also uh, uh, about because ethnicity is self-declared and uh, I mean I spend a fair bit of time in, in Wales as part of our first minister's there's black Asian and minority ethnic groups and actually even just looking at the terminology and how people wished it to be recorded I, I think that's still a, a real challenge uh, but you know I'm I'm really delighted that ONS allowed us to link in the census data and we're looking forward, hopefully, to linking in the census 2021-22 data um, very soon. I'll stop there. Great. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think you've picked up a couple of the really important issues related to that particular challenge. Uh, I mean, Vahe, did you want to say anything from the ONS perspective in terms of uh, taking forward that particular analysis? Yes, absolutely. So, unfortunately, I don't have the power to uh, ask give uh, Ronan the authorization to do it. If I, if I could, I would. Um, 
but yeah, so we've we've done similar analysis, uh, but looking at uh, a cohort of census respondents. So we haven't done because we didn't have at the beginning of the pandemic all the primary care records to do this. We've just focused on the census respondents, and we've produced some uh, analysis for the pre-COVID period as well for 20, 2011 to twenty nineteen. And we are hoping to carry on this analysis in several ways. The first using the 2021 census as a new uh, cohort study, basically following up people, but also trying to add ethnicity information on all the death uh, registration data. Because obviously if we, when you only look at the census cohort, it's only a subset of the, of the people who are living in the UK uh, or in England or any country at a given time. Uh, it's, we, we get about a coverage of about 80%, up to 90% for the 60 plus. But for the younger people, because we'll miss all the recent migrants, for instance, and, and a lot of and, and the people who didn't take part in the census, um, we're also trying to increase the coverage to get these people and to be able to produce statistics that include everybody and not just census participants. So it's quite a lot of methodological work that's going into it. And we're doing some work um, comparing the way ethnicity is recorded in census versus uh, administrative data, including uh, hospital data. So all, all work that is going to be crucial for allowing better ethnicity analysis in the future. Um, great, thanks. Uh, uh, Tom, Thomas, have you got your, you wanted to make some Yeah, I'm, I would just add that public health data science within OHID um, do a national um, excess mortality model, which uses ethnicity as a component. And they take that ethnicity by matching death records to previous hospital um, NHS records with various rules to select for where you've got different ethnicities recorded for the same individual. Um, and I, my understanding is, though I can't commit them to it, that they intend to continue this. Great, uh, thank you. Um, moving on to the, the the next question was um, around um, the explanatory factors for these various excess or reduced deaths. I mean, several of the presentations have um, have shown a, a sort of marked uh, differences in 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 different for different causes of death, um, both excess and and some reduced. So. Um, and it would be interesting for the, the comments on the factors affecting that, um, obviously, which is the next stage of investigating why these things have been happening. Um, anyone wishing want to uh, comment on that? Um, are those hands up from last time or? Um, I've raised my hand again. Yes. <laughs> right. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I think we, we uh, when in our sort of national analysis, I mean, we haven't only done this for the Northwest, we've done this for all integrated care services across England. Um, there are some things that are observed everywhere. Everywhere seems to be seeing excess deaths from cirrhosis of the liver. Um, others are more specific to individual um, areas and health systems. It does look as if certainly cirrhosis is related to an increased risk. There does also seem to be a risk associated with cardiac conditions across the whole population. There, otherwise, there are suggestions, and this is something that needs to be pursued, that these relate in part to low, lower degrees of system responsiveness due to COVID-related pressures. So, where the system itself is under pressure, this may mean that particular categories of um, care and colorectal cancer may be a particular issue of this where there is a relatively narrow window of opportunity from identification in the various screening programs um, towards um, confirmation in hospital testing towards treatment. If that process is working slower than we have been advised by a number of clinical um, uh, authorities that this could well result in higher mortality risk. Right, yes. Um, any other thoughts on the, I mean, further investigations? Um, or we maybe, you know, this obviously requires 
continuing looking at. So we'll, I think moving on then maybe to the, the next, which is um, a specific issue um, around occupation. Um, and I know this has been or, or raised with Varki already because there's been done some, you've done some analysis on this. Um, but I mean, the issue really is that the, it's a coding issue to some extent in that the, the codes when you're actually doing analysis of mortality by occupation, um, that links to um, level of, of um, skill and, and education. Whereas actually in terms of risks for COVID, that was more related possibly to you know place of work. And that wasn't picked up in that occupation coding. So is there any um, thoughts on how on looking at that in more detail in terms of um, the risks of particular places of work or types of work? Bahe. Yes, uh, it's uh, what the what was published on the ONS website was just mortality rates by occupation. And as you say, it's to a large extent confounded by other factors. It doesn't capture the workplace, the effect of workplace exposure. It's very difficult to do this using just this registration data because you don't have many information about people and your uh, but what we've done is we've done a cohort study based on the 2011 census where we looked at the, most, the risk of death, for, um, the risk of COVID-19 death by occupation and, and then adjusting for other factors that were not linked to um, ex workplace exposure. And we found that about 80% of the difference in risks between occupations are actually not driven by occupation, but by other factors. The big exception being healthcare workers mm -hmm. where that's which which is what you expect. Uh, in terms of doing more work, so now we do the, the main weakness of this approach is that we do only have occupation from the 2011 census, and now we are hoping to be able to start doing some work using the 2021 census um, to look at probably more hospitality rather than mortality because it's now that everybody is, is vaccinated, obviously the the risk of death becomes much lower in this um, age group, fortunately. It becomes quite difficult to do uh, uh, analysis by occupation, but it's not it's not an easy thing to do because <laughs> where you don't you never really observe workplace yeah. characteristics. If we could know that, like uh, where people work, for instance, it would be much easier. But we don't. Yeah, yeah. No, none of this is this is not easy. What sort of challenges? Um, maybe one final one of the questions that we we have you know we had earlier before we move on to the ones that were. Um, uh, raised during the the webinar, which is moving forward um, in terms of you know how we in the analysis that that um, carry forward. Um, there has obviously been a tremendous amount of uh, analyses produced uh, during the pandemic. Um, any thoughts on what would be the appropriate frequency of analyses as you move into a more normal state? And also in terms of making the, the analyses available, they are so complex and you can see from the graphs so many different factors. Um, any thoughts on the best way to make this complexity understandable to people when you're actually presenting it to a wider audience? I mean, that's another one of those challenges. So um, this is taking it forward, making mortality stats available more generally. You know, what's the appropriate uh, level of reporting and the, and the appropriate way to present it? Um, Anyone wants to pick up on that? Yes, Tom. I think we've had a whole series of ad hoc reporting schedules, but most of them now seem to be coalescing around monthly. So a number of things that we were producing weekly, we're now looking to translate into doing monthly. Other reports that we were doing less frequently, again, it looks like monthly is coming up as as the, the preferred option in terms of balancing the resources required with the need for up-to-date information. Ronan, you wanted to come in here. Yeah, I, 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 just on the point about, um, I suppose, who we're presenting out, producing outputs for, and I suppose there is, a, I suppose, a difference between professional statisticians and the general public um, in that. So, I suppose deliberately we went for sort of graphical approaches in, in the presentation that, that 
you, you saw earlier, in, in which you could basically see outliers and predictions. Um, on the grounds that we think actually you, you members of the public find that easier to follow than things like odds ratios, hazard ratios and confidence intervals around them. But it, it would be just interesting in hearing other people's views about to what extent they want to see if you like tabular outputs versus graphical outputs. Mm. I think that's probably something we need to take out and get comments and views on really, isn't it? Because, you know, we're talking among professional statisticians here and we all kind of love graphs and things. And I'm not sure no. to the general public whether that's something with the mortality stats scene group, they can actually do some work yes. to try and see what makes sense to the general public in understanding. But um, maybe um, we should now move on to some of the questions that have come in during the webinar. So I'm going to hand over to Rosa, who's been trying to pull them together and um, make sense of them. So Rosa, do you want to uh, pose some of those questions to the panel? Yeah, thank you. Thank you all the panelists. Very interesting to see the different approach from the different parts of uh, England and UK. Um, we have had uh, quite a lot of uh, questions in the chat. Some of them uh, have been already replied, but I'll take them again in case that some of the panelists want to add something to uh, their responses. Uh, so the first one was from Matt uh, Pinman to ba 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 sorry for the mispronunciation of the name about uh, the work from ONS. Um, he asked about if you have investigated the cases of myocarditis in young people, but not just for deaths, like for the incidence of uh, of the of this, and if there was a significant uh, found for cases. I think you replied about some of the limitations, but would you like to uh, add something else on on those limitations? Yes, uh, absolutely. So I mean, that's an excellent question, and obviously something we would be keen to do. Unfortunately, we don't have primary care data that are timely enough for us to, to do this analysis. What we could do is look at hospitalization. We haven't done that yet, uh, but there are already reports um, showing that there is indeed a risk of myocarditis, so using similar approach, but using primary care data. Um, so there are studies in the US, uh, England and Italy, I think, and, and, and Denmark as, as well. So yeah, there are already studies showing this, but this was the first study looking at actually actual mortality. But the big thing yeah, is looking at hospitalization in particular to look at whether these conditions have long-term effects or not. So that's a, a big question in terms of risk uh, risk benefit assessment. Yeah, mm -hmm. fantastic. That's that's very interesting. I might follow up for those uh, other studies, uh, international studies that that have shown already that um, fantastic. I'll go to the second question uh, that was from uh, Richard Elliott uh, to Joss. I think you already also answered, but it was more a bit a question on the interpretation of some of the findings that you, you present. Um, uh, so uh, on one hand, we had like, um, one slide that showed that the excess deaths in North Island followed the curve of COVID-19 related deaths, suggesting that the excess deaths were primary due to the pandemic during that period. But there was another chart in the presentation uh, that showed a stark difference between the location of the deaths between COVID related and excess deaths, suggesting that th there is a difference between the effects of COVID on excess death. So uh, is that the correct interpretation or how would you relate this uh these two these two charts my interpretation of the charts uh and, and i think you have to you know the first graph looks at the total number of deaths uh so once you go digging down further deeper into it uh you, you will come across some some differences what the graph doesn't show is the non-COVID deaths and where they appeared. So when you're looking at the non-COVID deaths in, in Northern Ireland by the place of death, you'll see a decline in both in hospital and also in care homes. So what seems to have happened now, uh, there's no, I have no evidence, but just uh, 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 an ex acceptable narrative would be that uh, people who are maybe in later stage of cancer, say for example, and are getting care 
if they are in the hospital in the, the height of the, the pandemic, there's no family visits, there'll be lots of restrictions in that. So people who might before would have preferred to die in a hospital with uh, all, all the care available to, you know, in those latter stages, would now maybe have thought I'd rather be at home with uh, a Macmillan nurse and uh, surrounded by my family rather than going into a hospital with these with these restrictions, uh, and that uh, I you know I've I've seen bits uh, and not just cancer but you know other other diseases as well and. Yes, I do not have evidence for it, but it kind of makes sense in what you've heard in in the press. Maybe that that's an you know, an acceptable narrative of what happened there, and so that's deaths. That so so for the non-COVID deaths, there is a reduction of deaths in the hospital, if you like. That was then compensated by the the COVID deaths because you can't have you know the the extreme interventions like in in the intensive care you can't have that at home you have to go in hospital for that so mm -hmm. I, th I think that was one one bit that hap happened that's but it's it's you know it, it's it's common with you know any any comparisons where they look to be moving in the same direction once you start breaking it down you you come up with with differences and you have to find an explanation for it Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the explanation. Um, I'll pass it like to the, uh, Colin has done like two very interesting questions as well. I think the first one was general, I think, to uh, the different uh, panelists um, asking about on the theme of the harmonization. Uh, any plans for England, Wales and Northern Ireland to start recording weekly deaths as per ISO uh, 8501 as Scotland does? Uh, is any one of the panelists aware of any of these changes? Uh, Tom, you're, you're knowing with your head you want to come into this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, um, it's something I'd love to see. I think everybody would love to see it, but Unfortunately, not in charge of making it happen. We'd be very keen to see it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in that case, uh, I'll pass it to the second second question uh, that Colin did. And is actually this one is for Ronan as well. So um, it's about the one of the models that you presented. Uh, say there was a negative binom binomial model was used to forecast the death in, during the pandemic uh, period. Uh, why uh, why have you chosen this model? And and was this a model tested for predictive power versus alternative models? Um, uh, okay, so essentially we're dealing with count data. And trying to predict what the future would be in terms of, of, of numbers of deaths. And with the count data, the negative binomial model fitted the data very well, which is a, a fairly standard approach that's that's used to do this. Um, Rihanna did the work. I wasn't sure whether the testing, how much testing for predictive power was there. I'd be curious of what alternative models is, is Colin suggesting that we that we might use? I wonder if Colin want to get into the discussion at something. Um, if he's still on the call. Well, if not, it's something uh, we might be able to pick up following the this. Um, and if he wants to get up like with the uh, um, materials of the of the seminar, fantastic. I think um, I just seen something come back. Five year averages. I think simple. Essentially, the, the I mean the adjustments we were making were, were for individual level, age, sex, also the sort of trend over time and seasonal trends. So I, I think that is essentially a more powerful way of doing it than just merely taking sort of a year or a five year average. Interesting. Uh, fantastic. Well, thanks. Thanks for your for your suggestion, Ronan. Um, yes, I'll add this to the answers of of the questions as well. 
Um, and I think there was uh, one final question from Diana. Um, I'm not 100% sure uh, uh, on the question, but so happy if Diana wants to come up uh, and, and uh, develop a bit more the question. But uh, she was asking not to any specific panelists. So in general, if someone has some information on that about are higher debts for elderly and disabled being be because more, I'm not hundred percent of the structure of the question. So I wonder if Diana is is around. I think, um, sorry, Rosa. I think what you're trying to say is that more of them are in, in institutions, and yeah. so what's a, how do you take out the 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 sort of place of living? So the higher deaths for elderly and disabled, um, and 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 the and the effect of them being in institutions rather at home. So is that that's what the question is? I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's that because they were institu in institutions, particularly in the early years for um, elderly people, where we know that the institutions had high death rates. Well, may maybe we can pick up this this question in 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 later in the in the materials, um, and, and and answer to you, Diana. Um, we'll try to do that. Um, I think that was everything in terms of the questions in the chat. We'll make sure we complete the the answers following the the seminar. So I'll pass it back to to Diana. Dina. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted, are there any sort of final thoughts? I mean, obviously, what we're going to be doing is we're going to let the, um, the speakers have a chance to look at the questions and, and respond in, 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 with, in writing, because you can't always pick up on everything in the, in the Q&A session. But is there anything that any one of you wants to um, uh, raise or comment on now at this point before we kind of move on to the closing stages? Um, uh, so, I mean, we've just covered so many different things and it's all so, you know, quite so complex and it would be really good to, and we're looking forward to having it sort of noted down and also looking forward to the further discussions with the uh, mortality theme group. And um, if anyone wants to uh, continue the discussions, they can do it via the website because there's an opportunity to comment when we post it on the website or they could flag up with Emma or with us that they want to maybe make some questions or comments via the mortality stats theme group. So, um, you know, we, we see these webinars as a as not just a one off and then we finish it at the end and say thank you. We actually this is part of prompting further discussion and ongoing exchanges. So, um, you know, we're sort of grateful to everyone who's contributed to the speakers particularly, but also we're hoping that, you know, this exchange will continue. Um, because there's, there's a lot more things to uh, to address, I think, in this as we move on. So um, I think if there's nothing else that anybody wants to contribute at this point, um, I will um, I will say I will thank you very much um, and and close the webinar at this point and and thank you particularly to the the organisers behind the scenes as always making this work. Um, and to the RSS for, for hosting this. So uh, keep an eye on what's posted on the website and offer further comments and suggestions if you'd like to as we follow up um, by discussions in that way. So once again, thank you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.